Hi, everybody. Welcome. I'm Olenka Villarreal, and it is my distinct pleasure to be here today as uh, we have a very exciting panel that we're calling Enriching Our Community, but I'm going to say it's called The World As It Should Be. And today we have some panelists that I believe will inspire each and every one of us to do what we can to enrich our own communities to be more thoughtful about all the different individuals that make up our world today. So it is my pleasure to introduce the panelists, and then you'll hear a little bit more about the work that they do, and then we'll have some time for question and answers. So the very first panelist is Dr. Lawrence Fung. Oh, we need to bring Dr. Fung a chair, sorry. Dr. Um, Lawrence Fung is a clinical assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Stanford University. He directs the Adult Neurodevelopmental Clinic, which specializes in assessing and treating adults with ASD, and the Stanford Neurodiversity Project, which strives to uncover the strengths of neurodiverse individuals and utilize their talents to increase innovation and productivity of the society as a whole. Second, um, speaking about inclusive community, uh, is Jill Asher that will speak about the Magical Bridge Foundation. And as the original founder of the Magical Bridge Playground in Palo Alto, I now run the Magical Bridge Foundation with my dear friend Jill, who will share more about our work and what started as a volunteer-driven project and has led to an exciting movement to reshape the play industry and make play and community connections possible for those of all ages and all abilities, and in short, far too many that have been left out of the fun. And Jill and I have both been part of many Silicon Valley tech companies, none of which have been as rewarding and as magical as the work we're doing today. Um, following the third person that we're excited to have on the panel, um, Elise Lalor from Monkey Ranch, who'll be talking about service dogs for autism. And along with Tim Howling, Elise founded the Monkey Tail Ranch in 2012 to provide service dogs for children with autism. The Monkey Tail Ranch has placed service dogs across the country. For those families receiving these service dogs, they offer the opportunity for horse therapy, camps for the entire family, including respite for caregivers, and ranch activities for siblings. And each of their service dogs is custom trained for the child they're being paired with, and they provide lifetime follow-up care and often aid with interfacing the, with the schools and the therapies. And um, finally, to represent uh, Dr. Well, Dennis Wall of Do Dennis Wall Lab at Stanford and the GAP Map Autism Resource Database Project, um, Dennis couldn't be with us today, so we have with us Caitlin Dunlap and Michael Ning, who are sitting here. And um, Dr. Wall essentially is an associate professor of pediatrics psychiatry. Psych um, psychiatry and Biomedical Data Sciences at Stanford Medical School. His work focuses on developing mobile technologies and methods in biomedical inform informatics to address the key bottlenecks in diagnosis and access to care for autism spectrum disorder and related developmental delays. And uh, following is Kate Movius, who I'm... Porter. That's okay. Um, addressing wandering in adults with autism. And Kate is the founder of Autism Interaction Solutions, whose mission is to provide effective training in autism safety and communication tactics for first responders. Her primary client is the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department. And over the past year, Kate has also been a part of the Bringing Our Loved Ones Home tax Task Force, who, along with the LA Board of Supervisors, recently created a strategic plan to minimize the risks of wandering for people with Alzheimer's and autism in the L.A. County. So, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, I'm so delighted to welcome Eunice M., who is running a California Sibling Leadership Network. And Eunice co-founded the California Sibling Leadership Network an organization that envisions a future where siblings of individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities have a thriving support network at all stages of their lives. She's the proud older sister of a young woman with autism who is her best friend and business partner. In addition, Eunice, um, in addition to leading this community um, effort, Eunice is also currently a first-year medical student 
at Michigan State College of Human Medicine. So I think you'll agree that this is a terrific panel. And without further ado, we'd like to invite Dr. Um, Fung to share a little bit more about the work he's doing with the Neurodiversity Initiative. Thank you, Olenka, for your kind uh, introduction and for the, uh, for the invitation by uh, Jew and Autism uh, Society. Um, so uh, the, the, the most important uh, credential that I have not listed is I'm the father of a 15-year-old uh, brilliant young man um, who's on the spectrum. So he inspired me to get into this. Um, so neurodiversity is, uh, is really about embracing the, uh, the, the idea that everyone is really on the same continuous spectrum. So we all have our uh, strengths and weaknesses. Some people run faster, some people uh, do math a little bit faster or slower, but uh, we, are, we are all human beings and uh, the most important thing is to embrace the strengths of, um, of each and every one of us and be able to use the strengths to really identify the person instead of using the challenges to uh, identify the person. So in the context of autism, we have um, known for a long time that perse uh, perseveration is very common. But depending on the context, it can be a strength. It can be persistence. At the same time, um, not being able to see the big picture can be viewed as detailed-oriented for some people. So some people are nodding, and de definitely you, you have some loved one that kind of behave like that. So few interests is also very common. But because of the few interests, they really get into the depth of the subject matter, and they become experts. And sometimes taking a perspective taking is an issue, um, not knowing what other people are thinking. Um, but at the same time, they are also very concrete and honest, and that's a really good virtue. Uh, social interactions, we know individuals with autism usually are not very good at that, but uh, they are also very loyal. So depends on the context, um, the, the same uh, issue can actually be a strength. So what the Stanford Neurodiversity Project uh, is um, designed to do is to really maximize the strength of uh, neurodiversity by first establishing the culture that treasures strengths of neurodiverse individuals and also empower uh, neurodiverse in individuals to build their identity and enable their uh, long-term uh, living skills and um, be able to live better throughout lifespan. We would like to attract talented individuals uh, to be involved in this project. We would like to train uh, people uh, that are uh, ta talented to serve this community. And we want to make it a model and then disseminate it locally and, um, and nationally. And the bottom line is we want to maximize the potential of neurodiversity, not only for the uh, neurodiverse individuals, but for all of us. So uh, this is a um, formal project uh, in the Department of Psychiatry at Stanford. Uh, it's a special initiative. Uh, the, the executive sponsor is the chair of the department, Dr. Laura Roberts. Uh, I direct the project, and uh, Mary Halbert, who is uh, here, uh, is the program coordinator. So we are uh, and, uh, trying to really hit on many different areas that are related to neurodiversity. The first thing is about education, and educating uh, individuals on the spectrum is important, but educating the people around them is even more important to make sure that they are going to be successful. We uh, connect with a lot of different departments around Stanford and also service organizations and corporations uh, around and uh, try to uh, develop uh, opportunities for employment and uh, also 
uh, we work with our colleagues in the law school and other uh, organizations to um, further develop uh, any strategies that, uh, that may be helping with neurodiverse individuals, like uh, public policy and stuff. And as a researcher, uh, I often, often joke that on paper I'm 85% researcher, but I, I, I seem to have 300% in my hands. And uh, for whatever that I, I'm involved in, I, I, I try to do research. So uh, the best thing about research is after you show that you have uh, a rigorous result, uh, data really talks really well. So p other people will be able to follow. So the uh, key initiatives that we have, I'm not going to uh, read them all out, but basically there are three major initiatives. The first is awareness and education. The second is work and uh, neurodiversity at work and wellness. And the third is independent living skills and housing. Uh, just about a year ago, we have this special interest group for neurodiversity uh, formed. Um, uh, and basically it's, consisting of staff and faculty members from various different schools, uh, School of Medicine, School of Business, and University IT, University Human Resources. And very quickly, we, we, we already have like 20 people in the first meeting, and then now I think we are close to about 50 people that are uh, interested in our monthly meetings. And uh, we attract people from uh, the local corporations like Facebook and Google, and uh, we also attract um, people that are f even on the East Coast, like Identifor, uh, Steve Keisman uh, is, is over there, and Magical Bridge Foundation. We are trying to f figure out ways to help with uh, different ways um, to um, collaborate. So another thing that we're trying to do is to teach our students about neurodiversity. And uh, next quarter is going to be the first time. Uh, and uh, we're going to be um, not only teaching them about neurodiversity, but also trying to get, them, get, get students to learn about how to do the uh, nuts and bolts of building programs related to neurodiversity. Um, and then uh, the student support program. We believe that this will be the, uh, the, the biggest uh, influence to the university when we are able to build a program that can help our own neurodiverse students. This will basically change our culture. Um, Stanford really takes care of students and students uh, that turn out to become, um, yeah, that, that turn out to become uh, successful are going to uh, tell people about uh, Stanford helping them um, despite they have challenges. So there are many different aspects of it, um, and I, I'm not going to go through all of them because of the time limit. And uh, basically, the other thing that we're trying to do is to build a uh, neurodiversity at work program that help in neurodiverse individuals to, um, to get uh, jobs, not in the regular interview process. So what you are seeing here is uh, th there is position search and the candidate search, and then uh, at some point we are basically trying to help the employer and employee the, and the prospective employee on uh, how to present themselves, and basically they would match their uh, the candidate's qualifications uh, technically, but not by how they interact in the interview. And after they are on board, then we have very extensive support circles from the team manager, the team buddy, the mentor, and job coach, and st study coordinator, uh, as well as uh, the f family, um, if necessary, and also per per uh, personal counselor or therapist. And uh, another plug is we are uh, uh, we started the adult neurodevelopment clinic, basically focusing on uh, individuals on the spectrum. At, uh, at this point, we, we can do diagnostic evaluations. Uh, later stage, we can do behavioral consultations and uh, as well as cognitive behavioral therapy, social skills training, um, medication management, telepsychiatry. So in 
uh, hopefully a month, uh, I mean a year or so, we hopefully we can get all the different pieces. And if you happen to know any psychologist looking for a full-time job, we are looking for one that uh, will be dedicated for adults with autism. And I uh, just want to thank um, my own department for support uh, and uh, Randy and Todd Goldman to, uh, to also provide their uh, generous philanthropic support as well as a major donor that uh, yet to be announced. Um, so thank you for your attention. Thank you. Um, just a as we uh, get ready for our next uh, panelist, just a quick show of hands. Has anybody not been to the Magical Bridge Playground in Palo Alto? Okay, well, I'm going to roll. We're going to roll a little short uh, video, and then we'll bring up Jill Asher. So please sit back and enjoy. Get to know our work a little bit. No one knows how hard it is for me to go to a playground. In a place where everyone should be included, I am not. My mom told me this playground is accessible and that it would be fun for me. My school says they are inclusive of everyone, so why do I always feel alone and left out? Grown-ups promise a lot of things, but do they even know that many of us don't even have a place to go and play? I may look like everyone else, but I'm pretty different on the inside. So I close my eyes and start to dream. I dream of a place where I am like everyone else. In this magical place, I am free to do anything I want, but I am safe, too. No one ignores me anymore or notices my differences. And the other kids want to play with me because I'm fun. It's a world where there is no bullying and people are kind, compassionate, and accepted for exactly who they are, no matter what body they were born into. It's a place where kids of all ages and all abilities can truly play, together. This place used to only live in my dreams, but not anymore. I found it. After all these years of wishing and dreaming about it, this miraculous place really exists, and all you need to get there is a magical bridge. Good, after, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Jill Asher. I'm not Jill Asher, um, <laughs> but um, she's a friend um, and a colleague. Um, so thank you for watching our video. And I hope that it is going to inspire you that maybe when the air quality improves a little bit, for those of you who have not been to Palo Alto's Magical Bridge Playground, you take a play date there. And I usually start presentations with telling people to just sort of think back to your early childhood, earliest memory as a child on a playground. And remember those feelings that you had. And my guess is that you were feeling safe, you were having fun, you were surrounded by people that you admired and loved, and that you felt fearless. And that is what we really want everyone to feel when they come to Magical Bridge regardless of your ability or your disability or your size or your age, we all should be able to play at a public playground. And so Magical Bridge was sparked because my dear friend to the right of me, Olenka, 
has a daughter with a disability and has a typical developing daughter as well, and she had no place to take her two daughters to play at any of the public playgrounds in Palo Alto. Um, and this was, you know, you want to be able to take your children there. You want to be able to play together and not feel socially isolated and alone when you have a small child. And a very long story short, um, Olenka was driving down to South San Jose doing therapy with her daughters um, because she could no longer fit into any of the bucket swings at the Palo Alto playgrounds, but didn't have the upper arm strength and the vestibular movement, uh, the, the brain development to use that vestibular movement, that rocking movement, which is so important for brain development as, uh, as young kids. So she's going to, down to South San Jose and paying $150 an hour out of pocket so she could swing her daughter for an hour a week. And that's like going on a diet for an hour a week. It's great while you do it, but what about the rest of the week? And so Palo Alto agreed to give her a lot of land in Palo Alto, and the, the directions were, you go build your special needs playground. Well, she didn't want to build a special needs playground. She simply wanted to build a playground that met the needs of everyone, right? We don't go to a special needs Nordstrom's. We don't go to a special needs Starbucks. Why is it when you're going to playgrounds, you are either designing a typical playground, which I'm sure all of you can think of those ramp and clamp systems that are that connected together, or there are the special needs playgrounds, then only the special need kids and their families really come to, to play at. So um, a group of us um, embraced Olenka's vision to um, come up with a new design, a new way to think of play. And we really looked at who were the people that were being left out of play, and a huge group of them were the autistic group. Right? At the time, I mean, the numbers keep changing. But we kept hearing like one in 35 or one in 45 of us um, are in the aut autistic group, and they play differently. They don't like those confined environments. They don't like the frenetic, confined structures that are currently existing today. And so we started working with inclusion experts out of Stanford, um, out of IDEO. We spoke to different groups, and we came up with a new model for a playground, which really became the magical bridge which is um, separated by zones and predictability. So if you want to swing, you go to the swinging zone. If you want to stay away from the swings, you have the slide mound, you have the spinning zone, you have a kindness corner, you have a tree house and a stage. It really is a magical place. Um, we raised over four and a half, around $4.2 million over many years. Um, and opened the playground in, 2000, in April 2015. Um, and we actually thought our work was done. And after we opened the playground, we started getting requests from literally all over the country and all over the world that they wanted us to replicate the Magical Bridge in their communities. We started a foundation. Um, it's a small, but very, it's a lean, small, fierce, mighty foundation. Um, we are under construction in Redwood City. We are going to begin construction soon in Sunnyvale and in Morgan Hill. We're less than a million dollars away from fully funding Mountain View. We will be announcing two more projects in Santa Clara County, and then next year we cannot wait for our foundation to announce the expansion of Magical Bridge in throughout the country and hopefully around the world. Um, but because we're talking here to a group of families um, somehow affected or dealing with autism, I want you to just, if nothing else, I want you to advocate for more playgrounds to be built for your family members. Playgrounds should be fenced in. Every playground should have a fence. It's for the safety of our children um, and our adults that sometimes bolt and run. You want open, more open spaces and less confined. Those existing play structures could not be any more of a nightmare with someone who has autism. I, and I'm probably speaking to the choir here, but those frenetic environments are just too overwhelming and too overstimulating. Colors matter to people with autism. Sounds, we have a laser harp that plays beautiful, gentle, gentle sounds that especially for people with autism, they, like, they can swing and they can, they can move their bodies around the laser harp and feel like they're connected to the music. You should be demanding this in your communities you should be talking to your park and rec departments. You should be talking to your schools. Because you can talk about inclusion all you want in schools. The moment those kids hit the playground, at least 20% of our kids are not participating on play structures in the playground. 
we no longer want those kids to feel socially isolated and marginalized. We want them part of the community. Magical Bridge stems from kindness and compassion for every single person. That includes the, those with invisible disabilities. That includes our seniors. As our seniors age with Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, guess what they like to do? They like to swing and they like to sway and spin. Groups with, from Alzheimer's groups and Parkinson's groups are coming to Magical Bridge to integrate into our community and be part of our community. We all deserve a place to play. We all deserve a place to feel community connections. And this is what's happening at Magical Bridge. We're just, a, we're just at the very beginning stages, but I hope, you, I hope you take us up on the offer to come and play with us, to come and advocate with us, and to give dignity and respect and the joy of play to absolutely everyone living in the community. So thank you. So um, this morning at 6.30, I got a call from my husband, and uh, there's a line that he has never seen a microphone he doesn't like. And he said, I'm getting deployed to paradise, so you're on today instead of me. So nothing like uh, leaning into the pressure of my absolute fear of public speaking. So thank you, everyone. I don't, don't blow off that Toastmasters class that you keep saying you're going to take. Um, so I have... Uh, Start, founded the Monkey Tail Ranch. We did this about six years ago, and before then I was uh, co-founded a few different organizations uh, for autism service dogs. So this is Dexter here, and we, strangely enough, I think he knows that I'm a little stressed out, which is why he's moaning and complaining. Um, so we do service dogs, and for our families that have a service dog through our organization, we also provide horse therapy and we do respite for the family. We train each service dog for the individual that is getting the dog. If you um, think about dog programs like Guide Dogs for the Blind, Hearing Dogs for Deaf, CCI, Diabetic Alert Dogs, the, um, that's very descriptive of what those dogs do. The dog is a guiding dog for someone who might be not able to see or be able to explain uh, to somebody that this dog indicates if there's certain noises I need to hear because I'm hard of hearing. Autism service dogs are a little different because autism is a spectrum. So we can't do a one dog fits all because find me two children on the spectrum or adults on the spectrum that are the same. So there's two types of dogs. There's emotional support animals and there are service dogs. These service dogs are not emotional support animal. I would say anyone that has a dog would also say their dog is an emotional support animal. These dogs have to be trained to indicate a certain behavior or help mitigate a disability. Um, so the benefits of a service dog are all the same benefits of your pet dog. What we try to train the dogs to do is to interrupt the stim, so perhaps self-mutilation, hand stimming, uh, tapping of the foot. This dog in particular who's going home in a few weeks is being trained that when um, his handler starts tapping his feet, he does odd taps. He starts with taps three times, then five times, then seven, then nine, and will go up with odd numbers of tapping. So this dog is learning that when I start tapping my foot, he puts a paw on my leg to help redirect that behavior. The reason uh, that's important is this boy who's getting this dog is starting to become very aware of his disability, and he doesn't want to look unusual and have his tapping cause attention to him. What doesn't look unusual is petting your dog. So he wants to have that redirection to turn into a pet. He's been bought in on this, he's been part of the solution, and he is the one who came up with the behavior that he wants the dog trained to do. Service dogs also provide a loyal, loving companion. A lot of these dogs are the first friend that these children and adults ever actually have. So that's not a service dog trait, but that is also goes along with what these dogs do. They also are social bridges. A lot of times when someone has a dog, people come up to them and they want to talk to them about their dog. They don't talk to them about why are you stimming or why are you flapping your hands, but they're asking a question like, what is your dog's name? Well, that's a pretty simple question to ask. Um, then they also obviously provide comfort, calm, and uh, reduce meltdowns. So we, reducing wandering and eloping. We are passionate about service dogs not being 
safety. So service dogs should not be trained to do search and rescue. Service dogs for autism should not be trained to act as an anchor and stop someone who may be bolting. There's a lot of um, issues with dogs that may act as an anchor. Well, that might be great for a four-year-old, but what happens when that child is now 17 and decides to bolt? You're going to pull that dog with you. I spent 10 years as a canine search specialist doing search and rescue, and my husband is still currently active with it. We know a lot about training search and rescue dogs. These are not the appropriate dogs to be training for search and rescue. We also don't want to task the family with the additional training required to do search and rescue training with these dogs. So there are many, many organizations that will say the dogs are trained in tracking to find your child. That might be right, but if a child elopes, call 911. Do not grab your Labrador. Um, and then the dogs also will do a lot for giving pride and confidence. This is Gus, and this is his handler, um, Alex, and that's her school picture. Um, our, uh, our program does a lot of encouraging independence. I've get, the question we get quite often is, when are we ready to get a dog? At what age? What's the magic age that a dog is ready? And it all depends on independence. Everyone needs independence at a different age. Some are 10. Some children are 20. When does that child start wanting to break away from their parents or their guardian and say, back off, I want a little independence? This is the time for the dog to step in. Too young, the dog acts like a pet. Too old, well, there's no too old. Um, so one of the things that we get a lot with teens, especially, is can this dog get them away from their computer and get them out of the house? So we work a lot with teens to work on a program of what the dog needs to get them out of the house. This dog will need an hour walk a day. This dog needs to be fed twice a day. This dog is going to need to do things with you. The more that I am able to personally work with the teen that is getting the dog, the more successful I am. Uh, parents, I know you've spent your entire life micromanaging your child's every movement, but when I get a hold of them, I'm going to tell you to back off. I'm going to want conversations alone with them. I'm going to want to set up a training plan, and then I'll talk to you on the side about what's really going on. But it's important that this dog is something between me and the teen and not involved with a parent because it's really important to make that jump between my mom told me I have to walk the dog to this is a dog I'm getting, and the dog lady told me I have to walk the dog, and I pull more rank. It also increases responsibility. So a lot of teens are not ready to have a first job, but they're ready to be able to start providing care for the dog. So with teens, I ask for monthly report cards, weekly report cards. I want to know everything about what's going on with that dog. I want pictures of the dog poop sent to me. I want pictures of dog poop in a bag sent to me. I, uh, I don't care if it's on Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook. Somehow you're going to connect with me, and you're going to do it about the dog. Mom and dad are not going to be involved. Um, and then, of course, I'm going to send it off, off to the parents, so don't worry. We'll, we'll be behind the scenes. For the parents, having a dog in a blue vest is very helpful for public scenarios when there might be a meltdown. So there's a lot of shame associated sometimes with a child who may look neurotypical, but they're in the middle of the store, and they're on the ground, and they're screaming and yelling and throwing oranges. Having a dog in a blue vest shows everybody that there is something else going on here and that the parent is able to take a deep breath and say, maybe I'm not being judged. Maybe people are able to see that I'm with a service dog and there's something else able to go on. The biggest thing is children with autism, some of them are nonverbal, and dogs are nonverbal. I had a cadaver dog, and he was deaf. And he was the best dog I had, and he trained me on how to be a trainer. And the reason why is that dog taught me to shut up and stop talking. So these dogs do great on nonverbal intention training. So these children are able to bond with their dog that are not verbal and able to work everything on intention. And that deepens the bond far more than any vocabulary can do. So body language and intention is absolutely incredible bonding. There's also dogs are non-judgmental. They don't care if you need to make sure your asparagus and your chicken are not touching each other. If they're touching each other, the dog gets why you're going to have a meltdown. They don't think it's ridiculous. Um, 
There is also a lot of tactile benefits to a dog, and they're a walking weighted blanket. A lot of our dogs lay over the lap of our children and are able to calm them down just by providing that kind of weight. Um, so our program is very dynamic. Not one dog fits all, ch all children and adults, and not all adults need a, a dog. But we do interview each individual participant, and we find what would work best for them. Yeah, thank you for having us. Um, I'm Katie. I'm a research coordinator at the Wall Lab at Stanford. And, and I'm Michael, a full stack web developer. Yeah, and we're um, here to talk about GapMap. Um, I'll just talk a little bit about the background um, of why GapMap was created. Um, as you all know, um, prevalence rates of autism kind of continue to rise. I think this year um, reports were 1 in 59, and increasing from last year was 1 in 68. Um, and one thing that um, I guess is part of the reasoning behind GapMap is to improve our estimations of prevalence of autism um, so that we can be prepared to provide, oh, sorry, so that we can be prepared to pr provide adequate resources for um, individuals with autism. Um, and um, a lot of times these estimates are, there's usually a lag, so but by the time the data is collected and it's reported, it's two years later, so we don't have really up-to-date numbers. Um, and another, along with, um, you know, improving estimates of prevalence, um, our lab also is hoping to address the bottlenecks and getting a diagnosis and then receiving um, resources and therapy um, right now, people report 12 to 18 month w wait list to get a diagnosis, and then another 12 to 18 months or longer um, to get um, therapy. Um, and this kind of, I think, trend continues across the lifespan for most people um, in um, finding adequate resources and support. And so, yeah, so our lab is using um, mobile technology um, to address some of these um, shortcomings in the current system. If we can put more um, power into the hands of families and individuals with autism, um, we think we can improve these bottlenecks. Um, and, um, yeah, I think now Michael will kind of go into more detail about GapMap. Right. Thank you, Katie. So we created GapMap as a potential solution to this problem. And GapMap is essentially a autism resource database in the form of a web and mobile platform that maps autism resources to families in need across the US. And through this, we hope to bring greater resource transparency to families. Um, we've accumulated approximately 28,000 autism resources, which we currently believe is makes up the most comprehensive autism resource database in the world. Sorry, in the US, we're not quite there yet. Um, but soon enough, hopefully. Um, so currently we're using Facebook ads to recruit families um, participating in GapMap. Um, and we plan on branching out to other platforms shown on this slide. So this is the landing page of GapMap. And as you can see, this is a visual representation of the density of autism resources across the US. And you will be asked to provide just your zip code and email address. And once that's provided, then you will, be t you will then be redirected. This is live. Oh, no, this, this, this visual representation is not. It's, yeah. But um, the resources, they're, up, they're completely updated. So, this slide right here is where you'll be redirected to after you've provided the zip code and email address. So as you can see, so, so this is search bar right here is where you input your zip code. And you can zoom in, zoom out, move around to find additional resources. Um, if you hover over these yellow markers, which represent the, re the autism resources, um, you'll be well, the, the, the service name will be displayed along with um, the address and, if available, the associated website. 
And also I forgot to mention, um, so these 28,000 resources, they've been allocated into seven different categories, namely diagnosis, therapy, health, education, um, recreation support, and other services. And part of our research includes calculating the average distance between families affected by autism and the nearest resource in their area. And we're doing this for all 3,142 U.S. counties. To refine these numbers, however, we will continue to collect physical addresses from um, the families that we recruit from Facebook and additional, the additional platforms. Eventually, this will enable a more accurate representation of the gaps in access. And also, in the near future, we, we plan on implementing several new features to the GAMAP platform, which will allow families to you know, rate resources, leave reviews, add additional resources. So it's kind of like a Yelp, but for autism resources. Um, yeah. Uh, so this will hopefully serve as a system that ranks resources, autism resources in terms of quality and help solidify a growing autism community. Um, at its core, GapMap is, at its core, GapMap is um, you know, a community-driven project and we can't really move forward without the families here. So you know, there's, there's no point in having 28,000 resources if there's no one accessing them. So if, if you know of anyone who may benefit from GapMap, please tell them to visit gapmap.stanford.edu. And I'll just leave this up here for a bit. So for those of you who want to take a picture, or, or yes. I've just been told that that's something that Kate's going to talk about, so it's a perfect segue. Thank you for that. You guys are in cahoots. Yeah. This Great is really tremendous, and even for those that don't have children and adults in, with autism in their lives, like myself, I do think that there's a tremendous value in that type of a resource for so many with a variety of disabilities. So thank you for that. Yeah. We're trying to do questions at the end, unless it's a quick one. Yes, please. Go ahead. Um, so this is just a platform that maps autism resources. So parents or whoever's interested in these resources would just enter their zip code and and um, see whether like what resources are near them. So. But is there any filter for age? No, currently no. Would be useful. But uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, great suggestion. Also, um, thanks for the applause. But we actually have a few more slides. I don't know if we're going over time. A little bit. So just if you can do another minute because we're a little bit behind. Oh, Thank sure. you. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, we just wanted to briefly talk about another initiative we're working on um, called Kids First, um, and you can reach it at kidsfirst.stanford.edu, and it's just going to be a centralized portal for families to access um, all the tools and resources we're working on developing, and we hope to make it really um, kind of engaging in a um, reciprocal um, system where um, parents and families engage as kind of citizen scientists to help inform our research, and then um, we're also able to give kind of live results back to them um, and see kind of aggregate results as, as more and more families join the initiative and, um, yeah, and also be up to date on things we're working on. Um, and this isn't totally live yet, but um, you can certainly register at kidsfirst.stanford.edu, um, and um, you'll get emails with updates on that. But, um, yeah, I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Kate Movius. I'm with two different organizations, LA Found uh, and Autism Interaction Solutions. Um, wandering on adults with autism, is, does this topic apply to any of your loved ones, the issue of wandering? Let's see a show of hands. Do you feel like wandering is a misnomer? It should be more like sprinting, right? That's my kid. 
Um, so I don't really have to spend a lot of time on defining what wandering is. That's what I do for lay people who are, are not in the autism community. Essentially, it's running off from caregivers, um, whether it's school, the community, um, you know, what have you, or in my uh, son's case, home. He, he's, a, he's an expert at getting out of our house. And the populations who are at greatest risk for this are those with Alzheimer's and those with autism. Um, and the LA Found Initiative, uh, which is a new initiative in LA County and, and really very exciting, um, we're helping those with autism and Alzheimer's with this very specific issue. So this guy gave me my PhD in wandering. This is my son, Aiden. He's 18. He's nicknamed Usain Bolt, if you know the Olympian. Um, this is supposed to be a video, but it, in this video, when it was a video, it just shows him doing, doing his jumping here at his Olympics at his school and then literally taking off out of frame and then zigzagging back into frame. And everybody's sort of running after him like this, you know? So you have this nice, this nice controlled activity and of course it turns into just a zoo. There he is. Okay, here we go. All right, Aiden. Okay. Yay, Aiden. All right. Okay, see you later. Okay, bye. All right. And right. Yep. Okay. Never a dull moment. Never a dull moment. Here he is uh, four years ago with the guys who found him naked on a major, uh, at a major, major intersection at 5.30 in the morning. We live in northeast L.A. in a very urban area. Um, the two guys uh, on either side of Aiden in his yellow shirt, that's his little brother in the white, had never met anybody with autism. The guy uh, on, the, on the left is a rookie, and because of the severity of Aiden's autism, it actually helped him in this situation. Um, he was, it was very clear to them that there was a difference in this person, uh, that he wasn't high on drugs or he wasn't just being non-compliant, which is a great risk for those who are verbal with autism, who go missing or have encounters with law enforcement. Oftentimes, those with high-functioning autism are at the greatest risk because they just pass. They almost pass. And if they're not responding quickly enough to what the offices are asking of them or they're behaving strangely, there are a series of assumptions that are made about them. Now, Aiden was missing for about three hours in urban Los Angeles. Um, and I won't go too far into it, but essentially there was a gap time between my waking up it, when it was still dark and realizing he'd gotten through the dead bolts and when they had picked him up. So he was hospitalized as a John Doe. And I was, uh, you know, whenever they would, would, would have found the caregiver, I was already under investigation by the DCFS, understandably. They found this, this juvenile uh, who was naked, and they needed to open up an investigation, which started the domino effect of all of those hoops you have to jump through. Um, I called 911. I described him. And they said, that does fit the description of a juvenile. He's at a local hospital. I can't tell you his status. I said, can you tell me if he's alive? I'm not at, at liberty to tell you that, ma'am. Can you, can you, no, can't tell you anything. So for 20 minutes, I didn't know. And these guys had to come to the house and vet me, you know, to make sure that, that I hadn't pushed him out of the house without his clothes on. Um, and I don't want anyone to ever have to go through that again. So a lot of my work has been, to, how can we prevent that? Now, he was so lucky to come through it unscathed. So lucky. We don't know where he went for three hours. We investigated every inch of his body, and everything seemed fine. We don't know where he went. We don't know if he met a good Samaritan here or there. No idea. What could we have done differently? I know this isn't a pretty picture of a lock here, okay? This is not what we think of when we think of person-centered planning, <laughs> and, you know. But, however, for my person, this actually would have helped us a lot and prevented that situation. I've been hearing differing things and feedback from people about whether this particular lock, which is mechanical, it is not electronic, is legal or illegal to have on the inside of a door. It, it, I've been told by the workers in LA is legal there. Um, this is not a fancy lock. This is mechanical. If the lights go out, this thing still works. Um, and it's given us a lot of peace of mind in the house, and it's not too expensive. These are stop signs, <laughs> um, you know, familiar to all of us with, with a child with autism. But just having these up, laminated stop signs, windows, doors, of course, continuing on with a behavioral program to teach your child about wandering is very important. We know these things. 
But in the case of my son, he's, he's got very little impulse control. So I'm sure he could access all that knowledge if we sat him down and talked to him about what do you do when you cross the street? What do you do if you want to go outside? You ask mom. But in that moment, there needs to be some kind of visual aid that could slow him down or remind him. I highly recommend that you visit the um, National Auti Autism Association website. They have a fantastic package and initiative on this specific issue. Um, and they give away these big red safety boxes. And so if you go to their website, which is um, nationalautismassociation.org, and you look under, um, well, big red safety box will be right there. They have huge amounts of free downloads. They have a family wandering emergency plan. They have a form you can fill out for your local law enforcement. Um, it's just a terrific resource. Now, here is Aiden on the left getting his tracking bracelet. For LA Found, we got funding to provide tracking technology to um, at least 500 participants, if not more, over the next three years. And it's going to go, it's countywide now. So um, we have, uh, at this point, I think 300 people have bracelets. There'll be far more as we continue to pilot the program. This, I can't overstate it enough, we can work as, as much as we want on our individual children, but we need to um, really bring in the community, the law enforcement community, hospitals, all of those different agencies that kind of work, as they say in lingo, in silos. You know, you have all these fabulous resources and agencies working on behalf of our children and public safety, but if somebody goes missing, in this urban landscape. These, these various pockets are not necessarily talking to each other. What this does, and at, this, at the scale that we're doing in, L, in LA, which is unprecedented, um, is that the sheriff's department has bought into this, and they've bought the technology, which is that sort of like, you know, Charlie's Angels looking thing that he's holding in his hand. <laughs> um, it's literally a radar. It's very, very, um, it's very old school. And the, you can see the little uh, white wristband on Aiden's wrist. By the way, he would never have worn that six months ago, for, for his entire life until six months ago. And I just started talking to him about it. I put a swatch watch on him, which was kind of cool looking. And I do think it was a product of his age as well. Aiden is now 18. And having these guys, these deputies, come into the house um, I know that wouldn't go over well with a lot of people, by the way, but it seemed to work for him. Um, and he wears his wristband. Now, should Aiden go missing now, I would immediately call um, the team at the Met Department in LA Sheriff's, which is the mental evaluation team, or they're working on this, 911. Ideally, I would call 911 and they would say, does your loved one have a tracking bracelet? They're still getting educated. You can imagine the number of people that need to be educated thousands upon thousands. Um, but right now there's a system in place, as imperfect or perfect as it is, it's in place in LA um, to, to bring our loved ones home and to track them. If he goes missing and he takes off, they'll be able to go up in a helicopter and they'll be able to scan um, a really wide range. It goes down kind of in a cone, so they can scan a wide diameter of neighborhoods, um, or they can go in their cars and scan up to two miles with their device. They've had a 100% success rate with this program. Um, the actual program has been around in Florida for many years, and it's 100% successful. So they've had no mortalities yet um, from you know, people who go missing. Um, police training is another piece of it. I do a lot of training for our local law enforcement, and I bring young men um, like this guy in to meet with them so that they know how to behave uh, with their loved ones. Here we have Bobby sitting in the audience, and there's Bobby with her two kids. Um, so training our local law enforcement is very important as well so that they know how to de-escalate situations. And here's my boy at surf camp, um, happy and free, as free as he can be. I do think that putting all of these supports into place does contribute to the freedom for our children, however that may look. Thank you very much. I'll be around Thank for questions you. if you have any. So I'm here representing the California Sibling Leadership Network, which is a growing community of sisters and brothers of individuals with uh, intellectual and developmental disabilities in California. 
and I'm thrilled to speak to you this afternoon about SIBs, oh, well, siblings. Uh, we call them, we affectionately call them SIBs, what the research tells us about SIBs and how you can get involved or connected with our growing community. So let me start by telling you three things about SIBs. First, uh, it's important to note that SIBs play a significant role in the long-term well-being of individuals with disabilities. Don Meyer, who is the founder of the Sibling Support Project and creator of Sib Shops, which is a peer support program for younger Sibs, he says that if you want to assure the long-term positive outcome for a family member with disability, invest in their brothers and sisters. And this makes a lot of sense because typically the sibling bond is the longest human relationship that any of us will have. And second, over the course of their lifetime, Sibs experience unique support needs. So the Pew Research Center uses the image of a sandwich to illustrate the generation of adults who care for their aging parents and growing children. Katie Arnold, who's the president of the National Sibling Leadership Network, builds on this metaphor when describing adult sibs, and she uses the metaphor of a club sandwich, because in addition to those responsibilities, adult sibs have an extra layer of responsibility when they take on the care of their sibling with disability. But note that this it's, it is possible to get a hold of this sandwich if there's help from friends. And third, there are many people who experience these needs. If you assume not, not 4.5, but five, if, if you assume that the five million people with developmental disabilities in our country each has one sibling, that means there are five million sibs out there. So the takeaway here is that bringing sibs to the table is an important component to creating a society where individuals with disabilities can thrive for the long haul. Okay, so before I introduce California sibs to you, I wanna briefly acknowledge the work of parents and self-advocates in bringing us to a unique time in disability rights history where institutions have been replaced by, with, with uh, special education programs, community integration, and independent living, largely due to the fact that families affected by disabilities and individuals affected by disabilities have demanded and created these changes. And so as a SIB, I'm excited to move into the future with you all to bring about more positive change. So I'm here today with my colleagues, Julie Neward, who's right here, and uh, Kaylin Ferris and Nikki Donnelly from the network. Jacqueline Moreno and Ann Dempsey are also part of the leadership, but they're not here with us today. We are all SIBs, and the love that we have for our siblings drives us to speak up and support each other. We've been active since 2011, but have been an official nonprofit organization since 2013. We host peer support programs throughout the state, and those on the executive committee have spoken at various venues to speak about the SIP perspective. So now let me share a few important things about what research tells us about SIBs, and let's start with the big picture first. So given the longevity of the sibling bond, SIBs play different roles depending on the life stage that they're in. This can include being a friend, a rival, a teacher, a cheerleader, an advocate, and a caregiver. Here are a few themes to note for SIBs, but I'm going to gloss over that and move on to this. So for the next two slides, I'm gonna speak briefly about what the research says about how SIBs are processing their experiences. So historically, research on SIBs has focused on the less than ideal aspects of their experiences, which includes internalized feelings of anger, guilt, resentment, embarrassment, and jealousy. They often feel alone and isolated, especially if they're from a two-child family. And SIBs often experience added pressure to compensate for their siblings' difficulties. But let's change the tone, because research has more to say. Uh, a meta-analysis of sibling research from 1972 to 1999 found a small significance in negative effect for having a sibling with a disability on the typically developing SIBs. So basically what that means is even with the challenges, SIBs are doing well. And here are a few things to note. SIBs report deriving positive benefits from their relationships with their siblings, such as higher levels of empathy, altruism, increased tolerance for differences, increased sense of maturity and responsibility, and pride in their siblings' accomplishments. And they may develop greater leadership skills, especially where understanding and sensitivity to human awareness issues are important. And some studies actually report that SIBs have low depression and good health. All right, so we would be thrilled to connect with you, especially if you're a SIB yourself, or if you know SIB, or if you consider yourself an ally to the community. Uh, when we're together, we can navigate better the vicissitudes of life, and we can also more effectively ensure that our siblings will lead full and meaningful lives. You can find us online uh, through our website, which is going through some construction, but the new one's coming soon. And we are also on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Uh, if you're interested in attending any of our social events, you can find us on meetup.com. And before I wrap things up, I want to send a thank you to Fran Goldfarb at the uh, USC University Center for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities and also Dr. Larissa Flegel at 
the Michigan State Center for Ethics and Humanities and the Life Sciences for uh, reviewing this presentation. And thank you all for listening. I just want them to but. Oh. Hey, listen, it's actually really amazing. We all finished on time, but I'm sorry there are no time for questions. Am I right, uh, Feta? Okay. One question. Oh, my goodness. All right, one question? No. No, he's going to be part of the panel. He can't ask questions. <laughs> Maybe we can take a few more minutes. I hope I don't, I don't open up a can of worms here, but the, just real quick, I think I think what might be interesting is to talk about, we talk about the spectrum. This is for Dr. Fung, the, 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 the spectrum, and that if we really look at some definitions now have autism as, you know, the, anybody who wants it can have it, basically, so that a lot of people, one definition is you're free to self-diagnose. If you feel different or quirky or anything like that, then you probably have autism. Is there a tipping point? Because... One of, the, one of the neurodiversity definitions was that it's behavioral traits, I believe, that are, have been going on for quite a while, and it's a no, normal um, kind of, uh, what, was the, what was the definition? But it, basically it was normal. Go ahead. Normal variation. Norm, normal variation of traits. Is there a tipping point where we see some of these severe behaviors like uh, severe aggression, self-injury, and so on, or where you would actually say, no, it's actually not normal. It's more akin to having some kind of traumatic brain injury. So That's a great question. Yeah, I, I, I think we also, uh, so I'm a physician. I'm trained to uh, recognize challenges and deficits. And uh, just like anyone, uh, I mean, without or with autism, there are some rough moments. Some people may have more rough moments. And I would uh, uh, basically submit that if we are going to be trying to focus on the positive aspects of uh, someone's uh, life, their strains, there will probably be helpful to reduce the negative moments. So uh, what, what I'm saying is uh, we, uh, we're not ignoring the challenges, but our model is basically trying to focus on the strains 